Okay, let's go to our preaching time. Our first normal Sunday together, 2020. Turn, if you will, to the book of Matthew, chapter 11. Matthew 11, please. Matthew chapter 11, if you will, please. And I'm going to begin there at verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Bible mentions believing in Jesus Christ, and the Bible mentions believing on Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, verse 2. But is there something to Christ's words, come unto me, that uh, are noteworthy, something we should pay attention to? I think there is. And uh, that's what I want to focus on in this sermon today. There's an invitation there in verse 28. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And there's a promise, and I will give you rest. Those are words to a very lost and a dying world, a world in which you and I live. And um, those are uh, world, words this world desperately needs to hear, especially if they're true. Uh, either he can fulfill his promise to give you forgiveness of your sins and hope, and comfort, and consolation, and peace of mind, and peace in your heart, or he can't. If he can't, then Jesus Christ was a liar, and there's no reason for you to follow him any further. However, if he can, you have every reason to follow him into eternity, Amen. and you can trust your eternity to him. But what does it mean by the words, come unto Jesus Christ. Well, that might seem like a silly question. It might seem self-evident. Well, it obviously means to become a believer and a follower of Christ. But is there anything to be learned from his words, come unto me? And I think there is. So I've titled this, rather than simply come unto Jesus, there's probably a thousand sermons on the internet titled, come unto Jesus. And they're probably all have about five or six views, you know. I want a few more people than five or six to see this, if they will. Uh, so just a way of remembering, I just simply title it, How Do I Get There? How do I get there? First of all, if you're taking any notes, when someone comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, they trust him to be their savior and God, the forgiver of their sins. Let me say this. God the Father is at work behind the scenes. God is working behind the scenes. We're told the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but he is willing that all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Christ said, All that the Father giveth me, shall come unto me, John 6, verse 37. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You know something? The Lord Jesus has never turned away a single person who turned to him as a sinner needing forgiveness. He's never said no to someone who said, God, remember me. What if he had turned to that dying thief on the cross and when he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom? He said, no, you're not, you haven't been baptized yet. 
What if he said, no, you haven't joined the right church yet? What if he had said any number of things as qualifiers, and then that guy wouldn't have been allowed? The simplest faith can get the job done with the Lord Jesus. God wants it to be easy for a sinner to get saved. In Matthew 7, verse 14, the Lord Jesus said, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The New King James Bible says, Straight is the gate, and difficult is the way which leadeth unto life. Let me tell you something. It's not difficult to get saved. Amen. It's one of the easiest things you can ever accomplish in this life. In fact, it's so easy, most people don't accomplish it. Right. They think it's got to, certainly it's got to be more to it than that. There's more to it than simply the gospel of Christ, isn't there? Isn't there more than just believing his death, burial, and resurrection uh, as a substitute for me? Surely there's something I have to do. There's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you can do. Amen. He also said, no man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. John 6, verse 44. God the Father is at work behind the scenes when someone turns to Jesus Christ. But make no mistake, the Lord God of the Bible is not the God of Calvinism. Where God overpowers a man, he saves him without the man's consent. That's effectively what John Calvin taught. And uh, some diehard Calvinists will say, man has no free will, so God has to do the choosing for him. And then they take that and they say, well, then God must have decided who he would save and who he will not save. And they go from there and say, God made two eternal decrees. Before there was ever a heaven and an earth, Jesus, uh, God decided who he would redeem, and he, he decided specifically who he would not redeem. These are God's two eternal decrees, according to Calvinism. And therefore, as history unfolded, some people were chosen to be saved and others were chosen to be damned. And they have absolutely nothing they can do about it. If God has chosen you, you're going to be saved no matter what you do. And if God hasn't chosen you, he's elected to, to damn you. You can't get saved no matter what you do. That's why... Uh, I'm proud to say that here at Bible Baptist Church International, for all of you watching on the internet, we consider um, extreme Calvinism to be a classic heresy. Amen. People, a lot of people who call themselves Calvinists, what they really mean is they believe that when they're, once you're saved, you're saved forever, eternal security. Well, we, we believe that, but it, we don't credit John Calvin. We credit the Word of God with that. As a matter of fact, a true Calvinist, if you take John Calvin's doctrines to their extreme, you don't even believe in eternal security. Because you don't know if you're one of the elect or not. It's a guessing game. And you can't really guess because you have no free will. Honest to goodness, nobody with a, a rational thinking mind could embrace the Tenets of Calvinism, not in 2020. But God the Father has to move on a man with some measure of conviction, some measure of convincing, and show him his need for Jesus Christ. But neither God the Father nor the Lord Jesus Christ force a man to get saved. They don't force him to believe. You have a free will. One of the things Calvinism wants to uh, harp on is the sovereignty of God. God has to be the absolute sovereign. He has to be the ultimate authority and in control of all things in the universe. And that has to be maintained at all times. Therefore, uh, if you, and they say that if man had a free will, he might use that will to reject God. Oh, really? Do you think? Well, of course he would. So God can't trust man to have a free will. 
Therefore, all of the saving or all of the damning is all based upon God's eternal decrees, generations and generations ago. If God is sovereign, if God is the ultimate authority of the universe, and he has all power to do anything, is God capable of creating a being who could make independent choices? Well, the Calvinists would say, well, the, the Bible says, my glory I will not give unto another, book of Isaiah. I'm not talking about God's glory being given to a man. But could God make a man uh, capable of, of independent thinking, self-governing? Sure he could. You have a free will, and you've made some dumb decisions once in a while. That's why there's a lot of suffering in the world. That's why your bank account is depleted, because you keep spending it over at uh, Jack in the Box, rather than saving and, you know, paying your bills. That's why a whole lot of things go on, because you've made some dumb, stupid decisions in the world. And uh, the idea that uh, you're not responsible was God's doing. Really, it was God's doing, because Calvin taught effectively that all that happens in the universe happens because it was so ordained by God to happen. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord, the book of Psalms. And the Calvinist will say, see, God directs the steps. What about the steps of a bad man? You have to then say God directs the steps of a bad man. It's God that caused that guy to go into the liquor store. It's God who caused that guy to go to the bar. It's God who caused that guy to cheat on his uh, wife or cheat on his income taxes, cheat on his job, cheat on his boss. It's God who caused that guy to steal what didn't belong to him. Likewise, the steps of a bad man must be ordered of the Lord. If, if God is responsible for everything. But the God of the Holy Bible is not the God of John Calvin's theology. He's certainly not the God of most modern-day Calvinists who take it to that extreme. So, while God has to move upon man, give a man an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ, give a man an opportunity to hear the gospel, give a man every reason why he should believe it. God's will is largely conditioned upon your willingness. God wants all men to be saved, but do you want to be saved? So your will has to come in line with God's will. Once those things happen, great things take place. Go to, if you will, forward to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. Keep your finger there in Matthew 11. We'll come back to that eventually. Matthew 23 and verse 37. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. Notice. But ye would not. Go forward to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And here, Stephen's testimony before they got angry and stoned him to death. Acts chapter 7. Notice what he so says to the Jews gathered around, those listening to him. Acts 7 verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears... Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Now, if you have no free will, it's impossible for you to resist. It's impossible for you to say, no, I don't want to believe the prophet God sent to me. But because you have a free will, you've made some bad and dumb and stupid decisions along the way. And people wonder why they suffer. In Acts chapter 10, we won't turn there, uh, verses 1 to 4, there's a Roman centurion named Cornelius, and he's described, quote, quote, as a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And he wasn't even a believer yet. But based on his desire, his sincerity in wanting to find God, God sees, you know, the Bible says, man looketh on the outward appearance. But God looketh on the heart. And based on his desire to find God, if God would reveal himself, 
the Lord sends Simon Peter along to preach to him the whole story of the Lord Jesus Christ and his whole household believe. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So while God is moving behind the scenes, you have to want God. When those things come together, great things happen and great salvation takes place. So while God the Father is moving uh, to give you a chance to give you every reason why you ought to receive Christ, I remind you through sermons, some gospel track, some invitation by a friend, some Christian who can answer a Bible question you happen to have, somebody who invites you to go to church with him, or somebody who comes along and helps when you're in financial straits, or you're in dire circumstances, and you have no friends, and some Christian comes along and says, let me help you out. Any number of things play a part in you uh, hearing the gospel and, and having a chance to respond to it. But you pass out a tract to somebody on the street corner, they don't throw it on the ground and ignore it because they're afraid of what's in it. They know what's in it. And they're not interested in it. And so they miss out on salvation. The problem is people don't want to know God as he's revealed in the scriptures. They want God who is a little bit like them. He likes the things they like and hates the things that they hate. They really don't want God, uh, to believe in God, rather, as the Bible portrays him, as the Bible depicts him in the Word of God. The Apostle Paul, he summarizes the, the, what's going on in the hearts of most men. He says this, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. You see that uh, black and white uh, symbol in you know, Buddhists use it, but also uh, Confucianism uses it, uh, where there's a black half with a white dot, and there's a white half with a black dot. It's the idea that the, the worst person, the black half, is still capable of doing some good once in a while. I mean, I don't doubt that Adolf Hitler uh, loved his mother. I don't doubt that he would have loved his children if he and Ava Braun had had children. I can't doubt that at all. And, uh, but at the same time, it means that the best person you know is also capable of doing something bad on occasion. And... Uh, so there is a general truth that no matter how bad uh, 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 someone is, they may do something noble and good from time to time. And no matter how good somebody is, they haven't done good all the time. I think that's what Paul is driving at. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none that doeth good. No, not. Well, you haven't done good all the time. And because of that, you're not qualified to stand in his presence. You don't measure up to the virtue and the righteousness and the perfection of Jesus Christ. Too many people are looking for a God uh, who is a lot like them. He'll get angry and at the, the pedophiles and the child abusers, just like they would. But he'll look the other way when it comes to the vulgar and coarse and filthy uh, foul language they use in front of their children. Uh, he'll, get, he'll look the other way when they're watching smut on television. He'll laugh uh, quietly to himself when he hears them tell a dirty joke to, at work. Um, and it doesn't matter how they uh, ruin their testimony by the things they do in public or the things they drink in public or the things they smoke in public. They figure it's between me and God. It's not between you and God because everybody else is seeing it. If you can't imagine the Lord Jesus Christ or any of his apostles lighting one up, or rolling a doobie, or rolling a fatty, or, or taking a, a hit off of someone else's joint, then why would you think it's okay? Why would you think there's no consequence? If you can't imagine the Lord Jesus Christ uh, buying a carton of cigarettes and puffing away, if you can't imagine the Lord Jesus Christ or any of the apostles or any of the greatest Christians you know popping open a, a, a brewski or opening a bottle of wine and drinking till they're just, uh, you know, under the influence then why would you do it? 
your life and your legacy as a Christian will either reflect well on the legacy of Christians before you, or it will suddenly bring that great legacy to a screeching halt, and you'll ruin it for generations to follow you. You know, according to a man named J. Gordon Melton, he wrote a book called An Encyclopedia of American Religions. The United States has 1,600 different religious groups. Half of those were started since 1960, 800. And uh, nearly half of all those groups are considered non-Christian religions. There's plenty of religion in the world, but most, for the most part, people don't want Jesus Christ as the Bible reveals him to be. Yet, God is still at work behind the scenes. God's still at work behind the scenes. Point number two, when someone turns to Jesus Christ, understand this. When they come to Jesus Christ, they agreed to believe the whole Bible. Bob Jones Sr. used to say, I've never met the atheist or the Catholic or the uh, Jewish person who, once they trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, didn't suddenly believe all the Bible. I believe the story of creation. I believe that God made the heaven and the earth. I don't believe it fell into, into place uh, over uh, eons of time like Charles Darwin suggested. I believe the story of the Garden of Eden and the man and the woman in the fall. I believe the story of Noah and the great flood. You believe all the Bible, uh, once you turn to Jesus Christ, he's the author of the Bible, suddenly you believe the whole Bible. It's not just fiction, it's not just mythology and folklore and ancient uh, Hebrew tales that convey some you know, great spiritual truth. You believe it all. It might make you odd in the eyes of the world, but so what? They're odd in your eyes. They're odd in my eyes. Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come unto me, that ye might have life. John 5, verses 39 and 40. The sinner who needs Jesus Christ needs to see how mighty and powerful he is to save a sinner, because the Bible says so. John 1, 29, he saw the Lord Jesus, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Once a sinner turns to Jesus Christ, he, comes, he believes that. He believes Jesus Christ can take away his sin. People need to see, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, 12. Because the Bible says so. And if the Bible says somebody without Jesus Christ does not have eternal life, then someone without Jesus Christ does not have eternal life. Because the Word of God says so. Man has to come to God God's way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. Well, if Jesus Christ is the way to God the Father, then church membership is not the way. Water baptism or some church ordinance or sacrament are not the ways. The Virgin Mary is not the way. Lighting a candle or burning some incense are not the ways. Joining a religious group is not the way. Giving money to some charitable cause, that, that's not the way. This cockamamie idea that, well, there's uh, one, Jesus is the only way to God, but there's hundreds of ways to Jesus. That's just a clever uh, dodge to try to get out of believing in Jesus, saying, well, I can believe in environmentalism, and that'll eventually get me to Jesus, and that'll get me, you know. You want to course your way through and eventually get there. You know, the uh, shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Go straight to the God through the Lord Jesus Christ, like the Bible tells you to. Don't be worrying about all these other things, hoping that they'll get you there. Paul says, 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. That's it. Now, if you pray to Mary, then she prays to Jesus, and he goes to God. That's two mediators. And the Apostle Paul is a better authority than the current Pope on Mary's role. 
or any pope or anybody else that says, do this, and that'll get you to Jesus, and that'll get you up. That's at least two mediators, whether it's St. Joseph or Blessed John the Baptist or, you know, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Peter, Paul, and Mary, right? <laughs> Remember when John, Pope John in the 60s, followed by Pope Paul in the 60s, and then Pope John Paul in the uh, 80s, 70s, 80s, my brother said, if that trend continues, eventually we'll have a pope named Pope uh, John Paul George Ringo <laughs> at the rate they were going. But a sinner needs to come to God God's way, and that way is through Jesus Christ. And when he turns to Jesus, he believes all the Bible. He suddenly believes all the Bible. Um, Hebrews 7, verse 25 says that Christ is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. It's necessary to come to God God's way, and it has to be on a Bible basis. Let me move on here. Uh, point number three here. Let me say this. When, someone, when should someone come to Christ? I'll ask that question as point number three. When should someone come to Jesus Christ? Well, ideally, as a young child. Ideally, as a young child, I got to thinking about this just this morning, and um, you all know that I was saved when I was a six-year-old boy under my father's preaching, and two of my friends, Brother Joshua Stevenson and Brother David Walker, both friends of our ministry, uh, have similar testimonies. Their dads led them, to, led them to the Lord when they were little boys, and um, I'm glad that the three of us had similar experiences where we were exposed to the same Bible. One Bible was enough growing up. It gives you a great basis for fellowship to say, I was saved as a boy. I was too. So was I. While it's still easy for you to believe, you trust what your dad and mom say to you. You trust. There, there's no reason to doubt because you don't, you can't imagine that they would ever do anything to harm you or to mislead you or to deceive you. So when your dad and mom can lead you to the Lord Jesus as a young kid, that's a great blessing. You know what? You spare that child uh, many years of heartache and bad memories and disappointments along the way. It's earlier they can get saved and expose them to every benefit of the gospel. Wherever the Bible is going to be preached, the Bible is going to be taught, you're going to spare them a whole host of heartaches and miseries. And so while God the Father was at work behind the scenes, our human fathers were at work doing their part to expose us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad that they were. But if not as a young child, uh, then you've got to be able to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as a young child. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein, Luke 10, verse 15. He said in our text, verse 25, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for, for, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Sometimes even grown-ups can be childlike if they're willing to trust the words of the Lord Jesus, trust what they read on the pages of the Bible. And those are the things that make it easy for God to work behind the scenes and soften that person's heart, that man, that woman, to uh, receive the gospel. I was working with a guy when I was in Pensacola years ago. Um, a couple of men I worked with were sitting around in the lunchroom. And one of the men was a Southern Baptist preacher. And he was going on about uh, someone getting saved and what they needed to do to believe be saved and um, they ought to belong to the right church uh, which seemed rather strange to me they need to be baptized uh, under the right authority you know and this other guy he was a united methodist and i was wondering what he was thinking about it because i couldn't tell if this guy was saved or not i didn't know what he was thinking about this other man's words and i was just sitting there listening and this one fellow paul he says, Southern, you know, uh, Alabama accent, well, I don't think anyone could get saved except through the blood of Christ, could they? I said, you got it, Paul. <laughs> you got it. 
That other preacher didn't have it. So, you believe as a little child. And so if you can't come as a child, you have a childlike faith. The Lord Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Mark 10, verse 14. So if the gospel is easy enough for a child to receive it, then who is anyone else to complicate it? Say, well, you have to join this organization. You have to follow these steps, these rituals, or these ordinances, or these sacraments. You have to do this, 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 and this, and this. I got a book back in my office called By Grace, For By Grace Are You Saved. Subtitle, The Work of God's Grace in Addition to Man's Works. Put out by the Mormon Church. They say they believe in the grace of God, coupled with your good efforts. You know what that is? That's a biblical heresy. Um, just about every heresy, every false doctrine is to take something that's true from the Bible and put it in the wrong time period. It'll be true in the tribulation, faith and works, but it's not true now. Works in the Old Testament were essential, and you couldn't get saved by faith alone. Right now, you only get saved by faith alone, and your works play no part. In the tribulation, it'll be a combination of both because you've got both to look back at. So you need to get things in the right place in the Word of God. All right, let me move on for time's sake. Lastly, when someone turns to Jesus Christ. Let me ask, who is God looking for? Who is Christ looking for? <laughs> well, the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. Well, if all have sinned, then all need to be forgiven. And if all need to be forgiven, then anyone can come. Whosoever will may come. Young, old, tall, short, male, female, American, Korean, uh, African, Chinese, South America. It doesn't matter what country you're from, what language you speak, uh, what traditions you, your nation may hold, what traditions your family has. It doesn't matter uh, anything else matters except are you trusting in the work of the blood of Jesus Christ alone? Because the word of God says so. And if so, let me tell you, God has been working to give you an opportunity to hear it, to believe it, and to receive it with a childlike faith. Can you trust him? He sure can. Can you trust to, can you come under him? Would you be willing to come under him if you had the opportunity?